What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com, part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. My name is Jeff Spiegel. Special guest today, Fabian Ardaya of The Athletic, live from Campbellback Ranch. Fabian, thanks for uh, being with us. How's Arizona treating you so far? It's good. It stopped raining, which was the big thing for that first week of camp, so it's good. Everything's good. Yeah, I, I went down I went down last year. I was there for one week, and it was, like, cold and miserable the entire time. Yeah. I was like, what the heck's up with this? Yeah, yeah. It, there's a certain point during spring training where the weather turns, or, like, a lot of times now, especially this time of the year, it's, like, really freezing in the morning, and then you come out there. It's in the 70s. All of a sudden, you're sweating. You're wondering what happened. So that's Arizona for you. Yeah. Well, I, I, we're going to start with the obvious one here. What's it like? I mean, I guess you've covered Otani before. Is that right? Yeah, I, I did so, when I was covering the Angels, yeah. I mean, is this comparable at all to the covering Otani as an Angel experience? Comparable only in the fact that there are Japanese reporters at all. But no, this is like a whole other level. Uh, all spring, obviously, understanding it's Shohei Otani, it's Yoshinobu Yamamoto, uh, the Dodgers, uh, the offseason they had, all those things together. Like This is the big story for them and big story in baseball right now. How does it make your life different? having hundreds of people <laughs> that weren't there a year ago. I mean, it's just a lot of people out there. Uh, so I think uh, a lot of times a lot more work at scrums as opposed to like one-on-ones, but you still have ways to sort of get guys. But yeah, uh, I think guys are getting used to the fact that there's me, a lot of people in the clubhouse on a regular basis now. Yeah. Uh, so Otani batting practice has had his second batting practice. His home run rate went dramatically down. It sounds like so reason for concern. Uh, no, as long as he's coming out of these, uh, batting practice sessions, feeling healthy, like uh, that's the biggest thing that matters. And that's been the case so far. And everything seems like everything's trending towards opening day, which is obviously a big thing for the Dodgers, big thing for major league baseball. I'm sure I'm sure they really want him there for opening day in Korea. Yeah. Um, I, I saw somebody joking on uh, social media that this is the first time they've ever seen people running away from Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman in order to go cover something else. It's, I mean, is it just like for somebody like you, obviously you've been doing this a while, you're plugged in. I mean, it's got to be hard not to just get sucked into whatever Otani is doing and to forget about everything else that's happening. Like, how do you, how do you manage the moments when you are covering Otani, who is by far the biggest story there, while at the same time recognizing that you're covering a team and not a player? Yeah, I mean, like yeah, the other day I was writing about Mookie Betts. And I was like, oh, yeah, he's the other $300 million guy on the team. There's yeah. three of them now. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, sort of look about this team. Like, obviously, Otani's like the big story because of, obviously, $700 million, everything that sort of comes with it. But, like, there are a lot of things that are interesting about this team, a lot of new pieces even. Like Tyler yeah. Glass now, and Oscar Hernandez, James Paxton, guys that besides just Otani and Yamamoto, who in a normal offseason, if you sort of went into it as a Dodger fan or covering the Dodgers, be covering the Dodgers, and they had acquired uh, Glass now, uh, Marco, Teoscar Hernandez, and Yum and uh, and Paxton. Like that's still a pretty busy offseason compared to yeah. last offseason. So, still a lot of really exciting stuff, a lot of stuff to write about. Uh, and that's the good thing about this spring because there's not really a lot of drama in terms of roster battles or competition. So, a lot of stuff to talk about in camp with the new guys. But other than that, like I think it's interesting to sort of keep it going that way. Yeah, you, you mentioned it. I mean, all the different storylines, the interesting things around Dodgers camp. You you touched on briefly a couple names. What are maybe two or three storylines or individual people that you're most curious to sort of track along over the next few weeks at Camelback? I think it's hard to go without saying Gavin Lux, just understanding what the situation he's in. It's the same situation as last year, except he, yeah. you throw in that he's coming off a torn ACL. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he's in a spot where he is – basically able to do everything it's just a matter of where he's going to be at come opening day they're pretty confident he's going to be ready for opening day but like what that's going to look like if how he steps into the everyday shortstop role uh obviously a little bit less on his plate than there would have been last year uh just in terms of how much the load he has to carry in the lineup but he obviously is one of the big names to be, uh that's very curious and also same thing with walker Buehler. we know he's not going to start the season on time but the fact that he's coming off a second tommy john surgery I mean, he's entering a walk year for free agency. This is a huge year for him. Yeah. Uh, so just sort of tracking his progress and seeing where he's at. Well, we've had vicious debates on our show about both of those guys and what are reasonable expectations for 2024. So I'll ask you, we'll start with Gavin Lux. Uh, I, we just talked about him on a live show a couple of days ago. He was a three win player in 2022. The last time we saw him, he had a positive weighted runs created plus over a hundred. You know, I joked, a bunch of guys on our show wanted to go trade for Willie Adamas. And I pointed out that 
Adamas had about 3.4 wins above replacement last year in 20 more games than Lex played in 2020. Two. So these two players from a total output, obviously how they get there are very different, but their total production, if you will, was pretty similar. And I don't think people give Lux the credit for that, that maybe he deserves um, for you. Like what are reasonable expectations for Gavin Lux in your mind? Like, do you think he's going to be a guy that is going to have a season similar to that 2022 season where people maybe look back and say, Hey, that was pretty good. Or do you think he's going to be a guy that in, in three months, the Dodgers are looking for a new shortstop? I think he definitely turned a corner offensively the last healthy season we saw him. It's just a matter of obviously if he can replicate that, if that obviously was his first like full season where he's able to produce yeah. like that offensively. Uh, so if he could be that sort of guy again offensively, uh, that's huge for them. I think the biggest thing for me is me watching how he looks defensively, uh, sort of yeah. understanding where he's at with his athleticism after the injury, uh, how he is laterally, how much ground he can cover. Uh, Dodgers have been really high on his defense at shortstop, just sort of knowing that that's – more of his natural position than second base was. He said he could play more fearless at, at shortstop as opposed to second base. You kind of have to restrain yourself a little bit. Uh, but he also was a guy who had some throwing issues in the minors. So uh, we'll see once it actually gets into game action. But uh, I think a lot of it's going to depend on what he can bring defensively. I think the reason why people, people keep bringing up Adamas, uh, one, the Dodgers have always been interested in for a long time. And two, uh, it's because the glove, uh, as much as anything. I think they sort of saw last year with Miguel Rojas, how well he graded defensively at shortstop, how much of a boost that is for their pitching staff. Obviously, Rojas offensively wasn't that uh, pro- wasn't as productive as they would like in an everyday shortstop, but uh, I think that's the biggest thing, big thing that sort of would draw them to Adamas if they were sort of in that position to trade for him. Uh, let's shift to Bueller. Um, I think the debate about Bueller comes down to when you look at the last few months that we saw him pitch, whether or not you believe he was healthy for those th- few months or not. Um, there was a point it felt like where the, everything shifted. He claims that's when he got hurt. If you believe him, I think there's reason for optimism that yes, it's his second Tommy John, but given everything, he may not come back as an ace necessarily, but a guy who could put, put an ERA up that starts with the three on the flip side. There's people that say, Oh, look, 92 miles an hour on the fastball. That's not going to get it done, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I'll ask for you, what are you hope? What are you expecting from Walker Bueller this year? Well, listen to him say he was sort of dealing with some health stuff down the stretch when he before he got injured. That elbow was sort of giving him some trouble. And I think that's part of the reason why his mechanics sort of went out of whack. Why he lost yeah. some of the shape to his fastball. Uh, the velocity obviously matters, but the shape to the fastball matters almost as much, if not more, for him, uh, especially with his release point and sort of knowing that uh, he's in a position now where. He definitely looks bigger, Like he definitely looks uh, like he added weight, which was intentional. He wanted to sort of be able to have some more muscle, so his elbow stops giving out is the way he's kind of, he put it out. Uh, so they're in a position where the velocity has looked okay so far in camp. But you're right, like the track record for two-time Tommy John recipients is kind of scattered. So that, yeah. that's a big reason why you have to kind of watch him, especially early in the season, how he adjusts, where the stuff is at. Obviously competitive, what they, like we all, all kind of know what Walker Buehler can bring, and or how he thinks through the game. If his body recovers like the way that they're expecting, uh, then obviously there's good things ahead for him. Uh, and like I mentioned from the beginning, like this is a big year for him in terms of his value and what things are going to look like for him in free agency. Do you think the Dodgers have interest in, in him being back beyond this year? Or do you think the moves that they've made, extensions that they've signed, young guys that they have in the pipeline kind of tells us without telling us what their, what their plans for Bueller might be? I think a lot of it depends on how he looks. Obviously, I think there's a like there's always that whatever the price is, yeah. like at the right price, they're always going to be interested. And it's sort of just knowing the person, knowing the guy. Uh, but Bueller's always someone who's like kind of understood uh, the financial side of things, the business side of things, and I think that's going to be something that's a factor for him in, in free agency. But obviously, knowing uh, sort of th- that this is a good infrastructure for him to succeed, so it'll be interesting. I think I really want to see how he looks on the field first before yeah. like sort of speculating on what his free agency might look like. Uh, One last question on starting pitching here. Obviously we know about the five or six guys at the top of this group glass. Now Yamamoto uh, Bueller, when he's back Kershaw, when he's back Paxton, who they signed Bobby Miller, I would add Emmett Sheehan into that mix. So I guess there's seven. Do you have a sense beyond those seven? Is there a guy that people within the Dodgers organization kind of have high hopes for whether it's a Gavin stone, whether it's a river Ryan, who's not on the 40 man roster, but I'm talking about somebody that they're like, Hey, you know what? This is our eighth guy, but we actually feel pretty good that if he comes up, he's going to be able to contribute. 
Yeah, so far, like, I think Stone is the guy that sort of stands out. Uh, he was the guy who uh, was dealing with a foot injury last year during spring training, which okay. kind of derailed uh, his mechanics, is why the velocity was kind of down to start of the season. He was kind of like searching for his mechanics all season long. Uh, so coming off of that, they feel like he's in a lot better spot this year. I think they kind of recognize – they've always kind of recognized his need for a third pitch, but he was kind of always like fiddling with what that would be. Uh, yeah. He kind of has two variations of a slider going into this year. Uh, so he'll be able to try to sort something out. And obviously, the big thing for him is the fastball changeup. And his changeup got hit really hard last year mecha- yeah. for some mechanical things. So he's the guy who, who they're still pretty high on. Landon Ack is the guy who's on the 40-man roster. We'll see what he looks like. But those are the main guys that are first guys up. If Nick Frosso would have been on this list if he hadn't had surgery like he did in November. So those are some interesting guys. And then obviously, it's the guys coming off the injured list. Uh, guys like Dustin May and Clayton Kershaw once they're healthy. Yeah, I love that. Let's uh, shift to position players. Let's talk about the outfield. Uh, that seems to be the area uh, with the most gray, we'll say. Uh, yeah. Outman, great rookie season, slumped, sort of bounced back at the end, makes you feel a little bit better. Not really sure how he's going to respond to year two, the book being out on him. You've got yeah. Jason Hayward, who, depending on what metrics you like, either had a, a fluke year or a really good bounce back year for him. You've got Manuel Margot, who we've joked, like, I still don't totally know if the Dodgers wanted him in that trade or if the Rays were just eager to to dump him in that trade. Um, Teoscar Hernandez, I guess, is probably the one guy you feel pretty good about based simply on the money they spent. Chris Taylor's in the mix. I mean, there's tons of guys out there. Um, Who who, who of that group do you feel good about heading into 2024? You can throw Miguel Vargas in that group, too, at this point. Fair enough. Because that's where where his work has been. But I think the Teoscar Hernandez is the one – uh, Teos Hernandez and James Altman are probably the two locks to be everyday players uh, okay. in some way. I think Teos is going to be in there against left-handed pitching, right-handed pitching. He's signed to be that middle-of-the-order bat. Obviously, yeah. the numbers are a lot better against left-handed pitching, but they're not bad against right-handed pitching. So uh, that's the main reason why they added him in. Uh, James Altman, at least defensively, is showing that he can hang at center field, and that's going to help him a lot. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Hayward has some experience in center as well, but those are both guys that uh, make a lot of sense. Uh, having another guy capable of playing center field was a priority for the Dodgers, just in case. Obviously, for the platoon numbers weren't best, yeah. weren't the best for Outman last year. So having Margot there, it, he does fulfill that role, even though he's not quite the defensive center fielder like that he once was. He does help fulfill that role. Same thing with Chris Taylor. Uh, I think the cleanest is a, probably a platoon in right field between Hayward and Margot. Uh, probably Outman out there more times than not in center field. Teos Hernandez more out there more often than not in left field. And Chris Taylor kind of fills in whenever, where, wherever and whenever, just as he's kind of always has. And I think yeah. uh, probably some infield, obviously, for Chris Taylor as well, just understanding that Max Muncy maybe didn't have the best year against left-hand pitching last year, understanding that like, other guys are going to need days off here and there. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's the easiest way to see how it splits up. Are the Dodgers done? Do you think adding on the position player and, and bullpen side of things, there's there's – been rumors. There's been smoke. Uh, Kike Hernandez is a name who's been mentioned. Kenley Jansen is a name that's been mentioned. Um, if you had to guess, do you think the Dodgers go into the regular season with the group of guys who are currently under contract? Yeah, in terms of the opening day roster, I think more likely than not, yeah. Uh, like Obviously, there's been interest in a reunion with Kike Hernandez, but they would have to trade someone off the roster to sort of make yeah. room because they, they don't have guys who are optionable that sort of make that happen. Their position players groups pretty much set. So to make that happen, obviously – and obviously, I, I know they have a great relationship with Kenley Jansen, understanding that maybe some relief help makes some sense, but they're in a position also where um, I think a lot of their moves at this point are going to be more on the periphery, maybe add some guys that are options later on in the season, but not necessarily yeah. for opening day. I, it's hard to really see cause just because of the roster mechanics that would have to go into it before opening day. Um, on the bullpen, one question quickly. We know Evan Phillips is about as reliable as a relief pitcher is capable of being. Uh, as far as what's predictable, they've got some other guys. Bruce Dar Gratterall had a great season last year. The strikeout numbers ne- aren't necessarily still there. Blake Trinan, when healthy, one of the best relief pitchers in all of baseball, hasn't been healthy. JP Fireisen, really good, missed all of last season. Um, Joe Kelly, I mean, Ryan Brazier. Again, Ryan Brazier, really good ERA numbers. There's some underlying metrics that that I think are make you pause a little bit. Like of the group I just mentioned, um, guys that are either coming off of career years or guys that have been injured. Would you, if you were like, do you feel good about that group, the Dodgers, the aspirations they have? Do you think the bullpen that they've constructed with the questions and concerns that they have is going to be good enough? 
I mean, I think that's an area that they could probably address the deadline if they need to. But I think they're in a position where they they've had enough of a track record, sort of finding guys on the yeah. on the edges, like finding a Brazier, finding yeah. Chris Martin uh, in years past. I think you've kind of seen in the last couple of Octobers, Gratterall has emerged as a guy you can really kind of trust in those spots, even though obviously you sort of look at the peripherals, like he doesn't miss a lot of bats. You would think that wouldn't play well in October, but it, it, he, for whatever reason, has locked in at the end yeah. of the season the last couple of years. He's always been on a good roll. Uh, Evan Phillips is a guy that they trust for a while. Uh, and as far as I know, Blake Trinan's velocity sort of rebounded a little bit. Same thing with JP Fire Eyes and after surgery. They're both in good spots, even though you're cognizant, obviously, of where they're at after shoulder surgery. And then uh, I'm curious to see what Daniel Hudson looks like. Obviously, he's an NRI yeah. in camp, uh, has barely pitched the last couple seasons, but not due to arm issues. Uh, so if he comes in and that leg is sort of in a good spot, uh, then obviously he's someone who makes a lot of sense as well in terms of that lead inning picture. But yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of, if they can find other types of guys like that, uh, well, there's some interesting NRIs in camp that would make some sense as well. Uh, guys like Kyle Hurt, even if, if he isn't someone that they see in the starting depth chart or they want to move into the relief picture the latter half of the season, it makes some sense as well. Uh, they have in, some intriguing arms, but yeah, they can always add. Quickly on Trinan and Fire Eisen, are, are is the expectation that those guys will be in the bullpen on opening day? Yeah, as far as, far as we know, like there's no there hasn't been any sort of setbacks that I'm under the impression they both came into camp healthy. Cool. Um, okay, last question. I'll get you out of here. You mentioned some NRIs. Uh, you mentioned Miguel Vargas. I think he would qualify for this. But is there a guy, probably not on most people's 26 man roster projection? Uh, that has caught your attention or maybe you've talked to some people within the organization to say, Hey, you know what? Keep an eye on, you know, so-and-so is there a name or two in that group that you want to sort of say, Hey, just keep an eye on. I mean, there's been a couple like intriguing arms that they've really liked in camp. Uh, like obviously, like I mentioned, Dana Hudson makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kevin Gowdy is a guy who's like numbers haven't looked that good, but he's like a side armor who throws in the mid nineties. So like that's okay. an intriguing profile for the Dodgers to sort of have. And obviously, like some of these young pitchers, I think it's sort of understanding where they're at. Uh, obviously, they're, they've always been really high on those guys, but sort of understanding where they are, are at. Guys like Stone and even Kyle Hurt, to like a smaller example, like guys who have gotten at least like a dip their toe into the major leagues and what they can do in year two. So, yeah, we'll we'll see. Obviously, it's we'll see, especially once you get into game action, like who starts to really stand out. But those are the guys, and obviously. Uh, we'll see what Miguel Vargas looks like. Obviously, it's a big year for him. He's in a spot where he doesn't necessarily have a role on this yeah. team as, as currently constructed, but they're still really high on the bat long term. So it's just a matter of if he can sort of get that corrected and then figure out the position for him later on. Yeah, we need to get a couple of the beat reporters to stop watching Otani's batting practice. I, I want to see Miguel Vargas fielding fly balls in left field, all right? You know, it's nobody's out there with the camera, I bet, huh, Fabian? Not as many as, as there are on Otani you now. <laughs> I love it. Well, hey, keep up the great work. You can check out Fabian's stuff over on The Athletic. Fabian, you're the best. Thanks for coming on and doing our show. And uh, enjoy the enjoy the cold mornings down there in Arizona. Of course, anytime. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on Dodger Heads. Enjoy the rest of your day. And, of course, go Dodgers.